Okay, live stream is up. PC recording good? Cloud recording started. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Parks and Recreation. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your video to minimize disruption? Please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Ku, we are ready to begin. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing today before the Council's Committee on Parks and Recreation. I would like to acknowledge my fellow council members who are present, Council Member Amadeus, Kevin Wiley, and Council, Ma council Member Mark uh, Jonai. Good afternoon, I'm Peter Ku, Chair of the Committee on Parks and Recreation and I would like to welcome all of you to this hearing, which will examine the Parks Department's inspection and maintenance practices for our city's parks and playgrounds. <clears throat> Over the course of last few decades, the city gradually reduced to the park system as the share of the park funding in the city's budget fell from a high of one and a half percent in the 1960s to 0.86% in the mid eighties to 0.5% of the budget by 2013. Recent years have seen a slight reversal of the trend. However, while the recent past budget was the largest ever in terms of the dollar amount at about $620 million, it still only it still only represents 0.6 percent of the entire expense budget. The historical trend is clear: we have not funded our past sufficiently. This hearing will examine the various tools at the disposal of DPR and the city to determine how resources should be allocated to all our parks. One such tool is the Pass Inspection Program, or PIP. Through PIP, approximately 6,000 inspections take place annually, where various landscape, structural, and cleanliness features are examined to determine whether they are in an acceptable or unacceptable condition. Recent years saw a trend of overall conditions and cleanliness features average acceptable ratings in the high 90s percentage wise. However, the most recent data indicates a slight drop since 2019 which I would like to examine a bit, as well as whether the PIP program is sufficient to indicate what the needs of the past system from a resource point of view. The council and administration have also worked together to find new programs to renovate parks, such as the Community Parks Initiative, CPI, Anchor Parks Initiative, and Parks Without Borders Initiative. It's a crucial program that target, that target needed renovation in needed parks and their surrounding areas. I am pleased that the administration recently announced a $425 million over for CPI but I would like to increase the resources of all of these programs. They have all been, they have all been met with uh, accolades 
from city office officials and members of the public, as they have definitely resulted in bringing creative approaches to running parks and increasing equity. However, while wide spending of capital dollars is of course critical, we must not forget the renovated past once the ribbon is cut and all the fanfare is gone. That's why consistent and sufficient expense funding is required so that they are properly maintained long after the initial renovations are complete. For example, in my district, John Bond Playground was a CPI project that received a $30 million re renovation. This playground is connected to the elementary school closest to downtown Flushing and heavily used by the community. Though millions were spent to upgrade this playground, not enough was provided towards maintenance, while apparently as this part has seen numerous issues with garbage and poor landscaping. I'm sure that this is not the only example. So let's not lose sight of the fact that one-time capital funding is simply not enough. Finally, we will examine whether there's enough transparency coming from DPR relating to maintenance practices, specifically Local Law 98 of 2015 required that DPR submit an annual report on the resources it allocates for maintenance on a part by part basis and post updated information regarding the status of its funded capital projects. Again, the question is, just like in the case of PIP, does this report provide city policymakers with enough information to determine how best to allocate necessary resources to our parks? I look forward to discussing this Issue, these issues at today's hearing and examine what other possibilities are out there improving resources for our parks. Thank you. We are also joined by Council Member Brooks Powers, Rem, uh, Council Member Bannon, Council Member Rambima, Council Member Rivera, and Council Member Bodelli. I will now turn it over to our moderator, committee counsel, Chris Satori, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair Ku. I'm Chris Sartori, Senior Counsel to the Committee on Parks and Recreation, and I'll be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you were rec called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I'll be calling on panelists to testify. <clears throat> Please listen for your name to be called, as I will periodically be announcing who the following panelists will be. We will first be hearing testimony from the administration, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I'll call on you in order. We'll be eliminating council member questions to five minutes which includes the time it takes to answer those questions. For members of the public, we will be limiting speaking time to three minutes in order to accommodate all who wish to speak today. Once you're called on to testify, please begin by stating your name and the organization you represent, if any. We will now call on representatives of the administration to testify. Appearing today for the Department of Parks and Recreation will be Commissioner Gabrielle Fialkoff, First Deputy Commissioner Liam Cavanaugh, Assistant De uh, Commissioner for Planning and Development David Seron, Director of the Parks Inspection Program Alex Butler, and Director of Government Relations for Matt Jury. At this time, I will administer the affirmation to each representative of the administration. I'll call on you each individually for a response. So at this time, please raise your right hands. 
Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Fialkov? I do. Thank you. First Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh? Yes. Thank you. Assistant Commissioner Saron? Yes. Thank you. Director Butler? I do. Thank you. And Director Drury? I do. Thank you. And at this time, I would like to invite Commissioner Fialkov to present her testimony. Um, thank you. I'm just trying to turn my video on. There we are. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Ku, members of the Parks Committee and other members of the Council. I am Gabrielle Fialkoff, the Commissioner for New York City Parks. I am pleased to be appearing at my first New York City Council hearing as Parks Commissioner. Joined today by our first Deputy Commissioner, Liam Cavanaugh, as well as David Saron, our Assistant Commissioner for Planning and Development, Alex Butler, Director of the Parks Inspection Program, and Matt Drury, our Director for Government Relations. Having served previously in this administration as Senior Advisor to the Mayor and as the Founding Director of the Office of Strategic Partnerships, I was fortunate to work with Parks on the Building Healthy Communities Initiative which brought the New York City Soccer Initiative to fruition, launched the farms at NYCHA, the first urban farms on public housing property in the nation, and focused on activating open spaces across high need communities. In addition, the office launched initiatives to reduce inequality and create opportunities for youth, such as computer science for all, and the Center for Youth Employment, among other efforts. I returned to city government in 2020 for six months to lead COVID pandemic relief efforts. And now I am truly honored to serve New York City once again as Parks Commissioner. My career has been devoted to leading organizations and forging and strengthening partnerships in both the public and private sectors. And I am looking forward to working closely with the council regarding the issues being discussed today. As this hearing focuses on the allocation of resources for the maintenance and improvement of parks, I would like to start today by highlighting an incredible success of this administration, the Community Parks Initiative or CPI. This capital initiative epitomizes the data-driven approach dedicated to equity and fairness that has served as the guiding principle for New York City parks under this administration. CPI is our agency's signature equity program, targeting investment towards neighborhood parks that have been underappreciated and disregarded for far too long. Through the initial incarnation of CPI, the city has invested $318 million to completely reimagine, redesign, and rebuild 67 CPI parks that had seen little to no investment over decades. I'm pleased to report that 62 of the 67 parks have been reopened to the public with two additional sites nearing completion and the remaining few projects well underway. On October 26, Mayor de Blasio and myself were thrilled to announce an extension and expansion of CPI, an investment of $425.5 million in new administration funding which will rebuild an additional 100 parks across the city. 10 park renovations each year over a period of 10 years. This additional funding will bring the grand total of CPI sites to 167 and close to $750 million in capital investment. 
incredible proof of this administration's commitment to the green spaces in our city and the New Yorkers who use them. The first 10 sites for this new expansion of CPI representing parks in all five boroughs will focus on neighborhoods that suffered terribly through COVID as we seek to help support and sustain local communities through this difficult recovery. As is our common practice, we will work directly with community residents to hear how their local park should be reimagined and redesigned to best meet their needs with modern accessible play equipment, more trees to provide valuable shade, park features and amenities for all ages, and increase greenery to help absorb rainwater. We'll build upon that community connection through the continued efforts of Partnerships for Parks. Our joint community engagement program administered with the City Parks Foundation, which allows us to cultivate new community partners and support existing partners to support the communities that gather in our reconstructed parks. As many of you know, our earlier CPI projects have truly been transformative, revitalizing and resurrecting public spaces that had been lost to years of bureaucratic neglect. And we look forward to continuing this incredible effort and delivering even more results for New Yorkers. This commitment to equity also shapes our daily maintenance efforts as we are dedicated to keeping all of our parks and playgrounds in the best condition possible. Over the course of this administration, we are proud to have consistently exceeded our performance indicators, targets in the Mayor's Management Report or MMR for overall park condition and overall park cleanliness even in the face of tremendous operational and budgetary challenges stemming from the COVID pandemic. To help make that a reality, our staff uses a variety of tools and approaches to ensure that all of our properties are getting the resources they need in a fair and equitable manner. Firstly, I have to recognize the incredible hard work of our dedicated park staff who are responsible for the maintenance of our green spaces. There are a wide variety of maintenance staff roles, including full-time, year-round staff, seasonal staff, as well as positions filled through our Parks Opportunity Program, administered in coordination with our fellow city agency, the Human Resources Administration. This year, these efforts were bolstered, bolstered by the incredible addition of 3,200 new parks maintenance employees serving as part of the administration's city cleanup corps, made possible through the federal government's direct COVID recovery aid and support to localities and cities, including New York. Some of our maintenance staff serve on fixed post crews, who primarily maintain a given park or playground, along with its comfort station and other amenities. Others work as part of mobile crews, cleaning parks and playgrounds along a pre-assigned route, traveling from site to site as a team. On a daily basis, our park workers are able to observe conditions in the spaces they care for, address issues as they arise and report serious conditions, concerns and conditions to their supervisors. Above and beyond this consistent presence of parks maintenance staff in our parks, we actively monitor and inspect the condition of our parks in several ways, including regular park inspections conducted by our park supervisors. In addition to these layers of careful monitoring, the agency also administers the Parks Inspection Program, or PIP, which is independently administered by our Operations and Management Planning Division. 
or OMP. PIP is a detailed objective quality assurance program, which is conducted independently from the agency's maintenance and operations staff. For close to four decades, PIP has helped to ensure that our parks are well-maintained and welcoming for New Yorkers and visitors alike. Created in 1984, PIP initially focused on small parks and playgrounds, but has expanded and evolved over the years, growing to become comprehensive and flexible enough to apply to all varieties of parks properties, from small sitting areas to our largest wooded areas. Even as the capacity of the inspection program has grown over time, it has remained consistent in measuring the safety and cleanliness of the parks that we maintain on the public's behalf. Our citywide overall condition ratings reached a low of 39% in fiscal year 1995, but has since risen close to 50 percentage points since then. Similarly, our cleanliness ratings have increased from a low of 70% in fiscal year 1992 to our recent cleanliness ratings consistently over 90%. The Parks Inspection Program has measured and reported these gains while serving as an important management tool for achieving improved park conditions. Our trained inspectors from OMP's inspection team use portable computers and digital cameras to perform 6,000 PIP inspections throughout each year based on very specific standards, giving each inspected park an acceptable A or unacceptable U rating for overall condition and cleanliness. Individual acceptable or unacceptable ratings are given to as many as 16 separate types of park features, which fall under three broad categories, cleanliness, structural features such as benches or fencing, and landscape features such as lawns and athletic fields. At the beginning of each inspection round, sites are randomly selected from a database of rateable park properties, a universe that includes more than 1,500 playgrounds and small parks, over 600 large parks or large park zones, and over 1,000 green streets. This inspection cycle ensures that most parks and playgrounds receive thorough PIP inspections two or three times a year, all in addition to the monthly inspections and daily monitoring they receive from our maintenance and operations staff. Upon arriving to a site, our PIP inspectors assess the entirety of the property owned or maintained by parks, including the surrounding sidewalk, to report on the cleanliness and safety of park properties. The inspection serves as a snapshot of the park as experienced by the public at that moment, regardless of standard cleaning schedules or other pending work. Park cleanliness and features such as play equipment, lawns, trees, benches, athletic fields, and comfort stations are evaluated and assigned ratings based on clearly defined and rigorous parks inspection program standards. Inspectors take photographs and when necessary measurements to document their findings. Hazardous conditions such as sharp protruding bolts on benches or trip hazards are noted as immediate action items and reported directly to MNO staff to be addressed. There are four inspection seasons each year, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Each season consists of six inspection rounds, and each inspection round includes approximately 250 inspections 
that take place over a roughly two week period. At the conclusion of each round, the citywide inspection results for cleanliness and overall condition are reviewed and discussed at regularly scheduled meetings where I am joined by deputy commissioners, borough commissioners, and other senior management. The results of these inspections bring focus to concerns that require corrective action so that the sites with persistence maintenance, persistent maintenance concerns can receive targeted attention and challenging problems can be tackled head on. The PIP results also provide an important performance review that helps inform our decisions about resource allocations alongside 311 reports and staff observations. In line with our agency's standing commitment to transparency, historic PIP inspection details for individual parks are available on the park's public website, in addition to citywide and borough performance data. More detailed line item inspection data is also available on the New York City Open Data Portal. Lastly, our PIP inspection results serve as the source data that helps inform our key maintenance indicators in park section of the Mayor's Management Report, which is updated biannually and available online. As you heard today, a data-driven approach to fairness and equity informs and shapes every aspect of our strategic and operational decision-making. The condition and cleanliness of our parks is a top priority of this agency. And we have worked to make sure those resources are distributed in a strategic and thoughtful manner. Of course, we are constantly looking for opportunities to improve our practices and protocols and look forward to working with the council as we continue to care for our city's park system to benefit all New Yorkers. I would like to thank the council for giving us the opportunity to discuss this topic today. After our panel convenes, our staff will continue to watch the public's testimony via the council's live stream. But first, my colleagues and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner. And I will now turn it to Chair Ku for any questions. Thank you, Christian. Before I, uh, I, I ask questions, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, other council members who joined this hearing. Uh, we are joined by council member Gennaro Cabrera, council member Holden, council member Dinovich, and council member Levine. Commissioner and assistant commissioners, uh, deputy commissioners, Thank you for joining this testimony. Now, you gave uh, a very detailed, informative uh, testimony. So I have a few questions. Uh, my qu first question is, what is the current total budget allocation for park maintenance citywide? Thank you, council member. I appreciate the question. As I mentioned in detail, we are, uh, our budget is informed by our data-driven approach. We do our two to three times per year PIP inspections, 6,000 in all in a year. Park supervisors inspect each park, each park monthly. And it is based upon those reports that we allocate resources. And we do so in a way that we understand each park um, gets different usage, different types of intensity and visits to our parks, each one different. So we, we need to be nimble and flexible uh, as well as apply our data-driven approach to this process. 
And I'm happy to have first deputy commissioner as well. Uh, what Follow is the uh, allocation? First deputy, would you like to give some more context? Yes, good afternoon, uh, council member Koo. Um, approximately 70% of our budget is allocated towards maintenance activities, uh, which, would, which would translate into a, about 400 to $410 million of our total budget. Okay. Thank you. So what is the current staffing headcount for maintenance workers based on the fiscal uh, year 2022 budget? At our, thank you, council member. Hmm. Um, at our peak, the parks department has roughly 10,000 members of staff, including seasonal staff, full-time staff, our POP members and city cleanup core. And roughly 50% is dedicated to maintenance and operation. But I, for this year and current, I'll, I'll ask Commissioner Kavanaugh to, to weigh in. Uh, yes, given the nature, thank you, Commissioner Fialkov. Uh, given the nature of, uh, of our operations and they're highly seasonal as you're, as you're well aware, our staffing fluctuates dramatically over the course of the year. We have approximately 2000 full-time staff in the maintenance and operations divisions of the agency. That includes the borough operations and some of our central operations which support facilities and, and programs throughout the entire city. Uh, that is supplemented uh, by the uh, park opportunity program, uh, which you know, varies of course uh, over the course of the year. Uh, at the moment, we have approximately a thousand uh, park opportunity employees working for us. Uh, during the season, uh, you know, we hire seasonals in, in several different categories. Uh, we hire approximately two to 3,000 people for the maintenance and operations division, roughly uh, 12 to 1,500 lifeguards. We hire five to 800 in the uh, security division of the agency to support the PEP uh, operations and rangers as well. Uh, and at the moment, we are very lucky uh, to enjoy approximately 2,000 or so uh, employees that were hired through the city's uh, cleanup core program. It was the, uh, the program funded by the uh, federal stimulus uh, uh, program that was passed uh, back in the winter. Uh, it has you know, served the city well across many agencies, but we in the Parks Department have benefited tremendously from it. At our peak, we had 3,200 staff hired through that program um, through, the, through attrition and people moving on to uh, back to school and uh, to other opportunities. We're down to about 2,000, but it, it's really been a tremendous uh, boost for our operations this year. Thank you. Um, so what is the role that the Park Inspection Program, PIP, P, plays in determining what kinds of maintenance is needed at a, a particular park? So uh, how are inspection staff allocated throughout the system? Thank you. The PIP inspections are a snapshot in time, and they are an evidence-based and data-driven approach to looking at all our parks in an equitable manner. Um, each and every park uses the same standards of um, to inspect the different categories, as I mentioned in my testimony. And every park, we do 6,000 PIP inspections a year. Every of those parks are visited two to three times a year. And so the same lens is applied to every park so that we can compare those standards in a rigorous manner. And so that we can look over time how those parks are faring. That historical looks very important in the allocation of resources. Um, I think for a detailed look at um, perhaps 
how those teams are made up with our inspectors. We have nine PIP inspectors. I'm gonna let D Director Butler, who oversees the PIP program, give a deeper look into how the teams function. Okay. Sure. Director Butler? Yes, I'm here. Him, the question, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. So, and, uh, uh, Inspector, what is, it, what is the typical routine for an inspector? I'm sorry, the, the role of inspector? Yeah, what's the typical routine, routine for an inspector? Yeah. Great question. Thank you. So, we have a team of nine full time, uh, well trained inspectors that cover the entire city. Uh, inspections is all that they do. And um, you know, we're, we're based here out of the arsenal, the headquarters of, uh, of the Parks Department. We operate on a two-week inspection round. And for every one of those uh, two weeks, we perform 250 inspections for 500 inspections a month, which if you multiply by 12, you get your 6,000 for the entire year. Um, in terms of the 250, uh, those represent a fair proportion by the inventory in each borough and by the breakdown of park sizes in each borough. So, uh, but these are inspections that are unannounced. They're randomly generated uh, inspectors in a typical day, if they're doing small sites, playgrounds, neighborhood parks, will do something like six to eight sites in one day. If they're doing larger parks, especially like our large wooded zones, uh, for example, the green belt, uh, which are more time consuming, they may do two to three uh, sites in one day. Uh, in terms of how the actual inspections are conducted, uh, we break down uh, a park into as many as 17 different features. There is a uh, cleanliness items that they're looking for that we hope to find none of like litter and glass and graffiti. Uh, then we're looking at structural items, paved surface for the past, safety surface, play equipment, fences, benches, and then landscaping things like lawns, court areas, athletic fields, trees, things like that. Uh, we have detailed standards for acceptability for every one of those features. Uh, and the, the line items that we capture fall into two categories. There's uh, hazards, things that require immediate attention, could be you know, a protruding splinter on a bench or safety surface that is moved out of place, or, or it could be a condition. A condition is not necessarily hazardous, but still uh, something that needs attention. So it could be uh, some bare lawn, it could be litter, could be a rusted fence, things like that. Uh, so they're capturing all that uh, and they're checking every single part of the park. They are taking pictures, they're taking measurements where necessary. Uh, you know, the, the burden of proof is on us to really sort of prove that a site deserves those ratings. So we take that very seriously. Uh, and then you know, at the end of the two week round, all this stuff is carefully reviewed. And then within two days of the end of the round, is disseminated to the entire agency. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. um, the commissioner just mentioned uh, the, uh, you, uh, uh, you did uh, 6,000 parks are inspected uh, a year. How many parks are there overall? And uh, how long would it take to inspect all the parks in the system? Well, I, I believe that there are 3,200 zones uh, that parks and subzones that we inspect as part of the PIP program, each getting two to three visits a year. Um, but I'm going to let Director Butler, maybe you want to expand upon that a bit? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so in terms of the time that it takes to perform an inspection, it, it absolutely depends on the size of the park. Uh, if we have uh, tiny green streets and sitting areas and maybe no more than a 10 minute inspection to cover the entire thing and to document what was there. Uh, playgrounds could take as, as much as 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes for an extra large playground. And then we have uh, large wooded zones, such as uh, the Green Belt in Staten Island. The inspector might be out there an hour and a half, two hours walking in the entire zone. So uh, as, as the commissioner pointed out, uh, since we do uh, about 
6,000 inspections a year, and we have about 3,200 individual parcels of property that need inspecting. Um, it does take us a, a half a year to cover everything, and it takes a full year to do two to three inspections. Um, we, we ensure that playgrounds and large parks uh, come up uh, no less than two times a year for inspection. Uh, and we wait uh, smaller like green streets and things like that that have fewer amenities for the public uh, as only one, maybe two times a year. So, so all the parks are inspected uh, at a minimum uh, two times a year, right? They include all the playgrounds? For playgrounds, absolutely. As part of the PIP program, and I, I will say, and we can elaborate on this, that our park supervisors inspect all the parks monthly. So our parks receive at least 12 visits a year from park supervisors. If there's a playground, they receive an extra visit in the fall and spring. So there's a minimum of 14 with the two, minimum two PIP visits a year, 14 inspections a year for our parks and 16 for those with playgrounds. Oh. So does, does, does every park get inspected at least twice a year? Everyone? Correct. Oh, okay. Commissioner Cavanaugh, do you wanna expand on that at all? Uh, no, Commissioner, I think you captured it. Uh, okay. Two, two yeah. inspections a year minimum for the park inspection program, 12 inspections a year for every park by our park supervisors using the same methodology. It does not factor into the ratings report, however, but the same methodology and the same approach. And then our playgrounds are inspected an additional two times a year, separate and apart from the monthly and the PIP inspection. Okay. So uh, the mayor recently announced the expansion of community parks initiative, CPI. What process is being used by DPR, by the department, to determine what parks are qualified to be covered by the initiative? Thank you for that question, Chair Ku. We are, of course, thrilled um, with the expansion of the Community Parks Initiative to cover 100 more parks and playgrounds um, over the next 10 years. So we did name the first 10 parks uh, for the first year of the new rollout of the initiative. And these parks, like the next 90, or, or these parks to start, focus on our neighborhood's hardest hit by COVID. Um, these are neighborhoods hardest hit as defined by the, um, as we're calling tree neighborhoods, the task force on racial inclusion and equity. And uh, these first 10 parks, of course, cover all five boroughs and are also overlaid with our original CPI criteria. That is our densest neighborhoods, our growing neighborhoods and those that suffer from high rates of poverty, as well as neighborhood parks that have received less than $250,000 of capital investment over the last 20 years. So we take that original criteria, we overlay the hardest hit COVID neighborhoods and that was the criteria used on the first 10 we announced for this year, so we could get going on them. And then the next 90 will come with a similar criteria and also input from our borough commissioners and borough staff and community and members like yourself. Okay. So uh, I'd like to recommend uh, uh, a playground in my district, uh, even though I already allocate money uh, for renovations. You no, know, it's the plan uh, playground near the plan house. You no, know, it's a uh, larger uh, community. And that playground is uh, right in downtown Flushing. 
and it's always dirty uh, because uh, we have the uh, uh, homeless uh, people uh, using the playground. You know? So I would like to like, maybe you prioritize and set uh, this playground as one of the uh, CPI project. We would be very happy to discuss that with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So my next question is, is uh, what is the status of the parks without borders and anchor pass initiative? Is there hope we can expand these projects with more funding similarly uh, on how CPI was regular, uh, recently expanded? Thank you. Um, I am pleased to report that the Anchor Parks Initiative, which allocated $150 million to one big park in each borough, $30 million for the identified parks in each borough. I, I have this in front of me, I can read them. St. Mary's Park, Betsy Head Park, Highbridge Park, Astoria Park, and Fresh Kills Park. Um, very pleased to announce or to let you know that St. Mary's Park is just about complete. I was happy to cut the ribbon on the new Gill Scott Heron Amphitheater there a few weeks ago. Betsy Head is completed, Highbridge is completed, Astoria Park is completed, and Fresh Kills Park we knew would have a longer timeline uh, due to getting sign off from our regulatory agencies and partners um, will design is anticipated completion in 2022. And uh, Parks Without Borders, uh, which was eight, $40 million for eight showcase projects, seven of which are already complete. And I'll turn to Commissioner Cerrone, if you have a few more details you'd like to add. Yes, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Council Member, for the question. Uh, the, I think you know the Commission really captured uh, those details on, on Parks Without Borders and, and Anchor Parks. Uh, but I think you know one in, important uh, detail to, to add with regard to Parks Without Borders is we saw a lot of a lot of positive response from the community because of the engagement, uh, and we saw really dramatic transformative differences uh, in those parks that we were able to touch through the program. And and, and the mayor gave us fifty million dollars for that program, which we we're very grateful for. Uh, and now what we've done is on any park projects that touch the entryways, the sidewalks, adjacent spaces. Uh, for those projects, you know, we incorporate the Parks Without Borders design principles now into that. So that's part of our of, of our standard uh, way of, of doing business uh, in designing future future parks and, and projects. Thank you. So, Commissioner, uh, going back to the question I asked you before, like. Uh, in my district, Blank Playground is heavily used and it's also a hot spot for homeless people. Uh, this part is constantly dirty and in need of constant maintenance. Uh, when past can, they go out multiple times a day to clean it. But we also had to partner with our local business improvement district to provide a cleaning service and litter basket changes. Uh, they pick up uh, many, many uh, uh, bags of garbage every day uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the BID, uh, but there's still not enough. So what is the solution to this situation and others like, like it? Yeah. Thank you, Chair Ku. I, I would like to work with you on that park. And, and I'd like to recommend that we have a discussion after this with our borough commissioner and the team, Commissioner Dockett, okay. to address that. That would be happy to do that. And, have and also, more. yeah, thank you. So also, I want to know, uh, how does parts utilize public private partnership uh, to meet uh, maintenance needs? No. In this case, we had a fashion BID helping us to pick up 
the garbage. Uh, but what about in other parks? And maybe they don't have a BID. Uh, so how how do you use, utilize public-private partnership? Thank you. We do work with our partnership for parks, of course, with the city, our partner with the City Parks Foundation, and of course, the role of conservancies play an important role in maintaining our parks. We, at the launch of CPI, the first tranche 1.0, as we call it here, we partnered with our conservancy partners um, to map out a plan how they could also help all the CPI parks in terms of design um, and other um, ways that they could train the community lend their expertise and their services. And that's been a tremendously successful effort. And we will continue those conversations for the next tranche of CPI and work with our partners, uh, the conservancies, and of course, all of our community partners. I will say that a great benefit uh, or an outcome of CPI has been the engagement of our community partners, the Partnership for Parks efforts, um, from that, there have been many friends groups that have been formed around the revamped CPI parks. 85% of our first 67 CPI parks have now community groups attached to it. And we have seen the maintenance scores, the overall cleanliness and conditions of the CPI parks improve dramatically. Uh, because of the community engagement, the friends group, these public-private partnerships, and I think a real source of pride for the communities and, and the, the neighborhoods stewarding these new reno newly renovated parks, as well as a more formal groups with our Partnership for Parks and City Parks Foundation partners. Hey, thank you, Commissioner. So we are also joined by Council Member Aurich and Council Member Moyer. Uh, Commissioner, in my district, years ago, we had a couple of complaints about overgrowth, which made parts of the playground inaccessible. Uh, the CSAs, the general city park workers, are not able to handle the horticultural aspects. So uh, gardeners were needed. However, at the same time, gardeners are often taken away from their specialized work to do things like park cleanup. So how does park tracks horticultural tasks? And are gardeners are in fact being pulled away from regular gardening duties to fill in other roles that may not be gardening related? Thank you. As I uh, mentioned in my testimony, we do strive to treat every park equitably and apply our data-driven approach um, to each park and, and the allocation of resources and staff. But I will let the real expert um, in this area uh, address this. Commissioner Kavanaugh, please. Thank you, Commissioner and, and Council Member. We absolutely value the work of our gardeners. We try to support them in many different ways. Uh, we're right in the middle of a, uh, of a skills assessment to, uh, uh, to, uh, to see you know, what support our gardeners feel they need to be more effective in their work throughout the city. And our gardeners do tremendous work. Uh, every month when we review our operations uh, metrics, uh, we also review what we call the Gardener of the Month. Uh, where we look at the great work that our gardeners do throughout the city. Uh, and it's really impressive uh, to see. I see it when I drive around the city, but uh, those Garden of the Month presentations are really outstanding. Uh, yes, occasionally, everyone who works in the field for the Parks Department may be asked to do something like litter removal or, or assist at a special event and things like that. It does happen with the gardeners. I don't think it deters them or detracts from the, the great work that they do. Uh, if you're aware of a specific situation where that is occurring uh, repeatedly or in an extremely you know, 
regular amount of time, you know, please let us know and we'll, we'll definitely look into it. But, uh, you know, I have to say that thanks to the support of the council through the Play Fair initiative, uh, you know, we have dramatically increased the number of gardeners working it throughout the park system and we really work to support them in, in the great work that they do. Thank you. So uh, I have a, a one more question, then I'll turn over to other members. So regarding the new federal infrastructure bill and new state money, is PASS attempting to obtain these funds? If so, what has the department identified in terms of what this additional money will, uh, will fund? We, we have been talking to our partners in the administration uh, and, and OMB about mm -hmm. projects that we feel, infrastructure projects that we feel would be suitable for um, this federal funding. Yes. And I could ask Commissioner Cerrone, who is our head of planning, to maybe weigh in a little more on those projects. Yes, uh, Chair Ku, uh, thank you for the question. Thank you, Com Commissioner. Um, as the Commissioner said, we're, we're certainly interested uh, and you know, parks play a vital role in, in the city's infrastructure. Uh, so you know, road projects, bridge projects, greenway projects, um, projects to com connect disconnected communities, uh, EV projects, they're all uh, a variety of the, of the subjects that we're looking into. It's very early in this stage. So we're still you know, uh, collecting information, but we're, we're also actively working on this and we're happy to discuss it uh, further with you. Okay, so uh, I finished my questions. Um, now I want to turn over to uh, uh, our um, moderator, Quinn. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Can you Chair. see whether other members have a question? Yes. Yes, Chair. Thank you, Chair Ku. Uh, at this time, we will turn it over to questions from other council members. Um, and I would ask if, if, if you have a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Uh, we will limit council member questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer to let you know when your time is up. Uh, you should begin once I have called on you and the sergeant has announced that uh, you can begin your questions. At this point, we have count, uh, questions from council member Holden followed by council member Brooks Powers. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you, commissioner and welcome. Um, nice to see you and uh, hope to see you in person mm -hmm. uh, soon. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a, a few questions on um, sort of the timeliness of, of, of Park's response uh, to my office and, and, and just to the public in general. Um, and, you know, at the, um, I think it was the September 27th hearing we had in Parks that I spoke to First Deputy Commissioner Liam Cavanaugh about trees, and that's my favorite subject. Um, and I put money into trees, I put capital money, I put uh, uh, a lot of um, resources in you know, tree pits and so forth. And um, Commissioner Cavanaugh said he was gonna contact me um, in September to come out to my district to survey the trees and take a tour, I'm still waiting. Uh, and here we are, you know, entering the holiday season, and I have problems. You name it, I have problems with trees. Tro problems with trees planted, uh, the lack thereof. Problems with stump removal. Uh, problems with sidewalks being fixed. That's uh, I know that's uh, multiple, you know, agency responses. But then I also have a problem with capital projects that constantly get stalled, delayed and no reporting, no updates. And my park, my track is closed in Juniper Valley Park for God knows how long now because of a crushed, uh, apparently a crushed, they discovered a crushed uh, drainage. They, you know, some, some uh, project or some part of the project that was uh, flawed or it wasn't anticipated. So there's got, what I, I'm getting to a bigger picture here. There's got to be a better response. There's got to be a more, an attitude that let's get, let's move these projects along. 
whether it's be, trees being planted, whether it's stumps being removed, whether it's um, projects that are delayed. The, every project that I've dealt with in my district has been delayed, any capital project has been delayed. Uh, and it's, it's getting to the point where I'm, I'm not putting money into, into capital projects unless this problem is fixed. We, we seem to have a ridiculously high prices. Every council member knows about the prices of parks projects, which is they're way out of whack. And I hope the new council tries to address that. But it's just, there's no excuse for somebody not getting back to us. Um, for instance, I took a tree tour with um, parks personnel, uh, October 13th. I asked a number of questions. When could I start getting trees planted? How many trees can I get planted in my district? Uh, priority areas. And that was October 13th. Multiple emails to parks were unanswered. Just unanswered. No, we, three or four emails, nothing, nobody gets back to us. I met about, um, I'm, I'm putting in tree pits with uh, iron gates, iron railings to replace ones that were poorly designed 10 years ago. And I'm not, I'm not getting any answers. So it, it just seems to be, and you know, and I got along well with Queens Parks. I, I think I, I know a lot of the personnel. And one of, of course is uh, Joanna Magrande, who's leaving after 38 years, irreplaceable. Uh, I've known her for that long. I knew her when she came in. Um, mm. And it, it's just, but, but it's just that it, nothing ever changes in parks. It just seems to be the agency that we have big problems with. And it's so vital now. I know I'm going out of focus. It's weird, but that's my camera. <laughs> um, but kind of that's how I feel. Uh, a little, a little kind of. I've de I've dedicated most of my life to parks, and I'm just not getting the answers. I'm I'm not getting answers on capital projects, like I said, trees or anything else. And all I want is answers. I, you know, you, if I have access, even my own my own house. Um, I have a tree in front of my house that died five years ago. I finally got it cut two years ago, right? Cut down. Stump's still there. I put in for a tree, no tree. And, and then, you know, that's what my constituents are experiencing. So if you could somehow give, guide us through those, pro those problems, the trees especially, that, you know, that we're going to get some answers to. And maybe um, uh, Commissioner Cavanaugh can explain it. If, he, if you can. Well, I, I will start off by saying. Um, Time expired. Right under the wire. You can go. No, you can go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I, you know, we, we strive to be responsive always um, to you, our council members, to all New Yorkers um, at all times. I think you've addressed a few, a few topics. Um, on the capital process, we have made strides in this administration. It, it may not feel that way, uh, but we have worked hard um, on the processes that are under our uh, largely under uh, parks jurisdiction. We have made strides, particularly in the design timeline to shave off um, significant amount of time in, in the processes we've changed. We have seen an improvement of six to seven months in that time frame um, and have cut that out of the process. We, of course, feel that more needs to be done and particularly from the city's processes uh, around procurement of construction contractors. That is an area we, you know, we encourage the city to make progress on. Um, so uh, we are taking steps uh, as far as the capital process goes of what is under, largely under our control. Um, for trees and um, your other concerns, I certainly wanna allow Commissioner Kavanaugh a chance to respond uh, 
to, to your comments and, you know, trees are vital infrastructure. Um, uh, we feel that way, uh, key to climate change and, and making the city livable. So Commissioner Kavanaugh, please. Thank you, Commissioner Fialka. And uh, Council Member, I apologize for not following through on our conversation at the September, September hearing. Uh, I, will, my, I will contact your office immediately after this hearing and schedule a date at the earliest convenience to review all of the tree work that is happening in your district. Okay, J just an observation though. Um, uh, and, this, and again, this is, goes over all, all projects, but Commissioner, we give and and this is um, this is not a surprise, but we give way too much time for contractors to complete a job. It, Ninety, I would say, ninety percent of the jobs that I've witnessed in my lifetime, and I'm going back thirty years now of working with parks, maybe maybe even almost closer to forty. Every project, probably ninety percent of the time, the contractor is not even present on the site, and I think you guys know it. That that where where we have our parks offline because somebody is not scheduling something or, or we're just giving way too many, way too much time for these contractors. And I think every council member will agree with, with me um, who's, who, uh, who's seen this. So much so that I would love to go to design build or I would like to go for the trust for public land. I would like to open up the process where we get some competition. And obviously to me, I've given up on parks managing projects in a, in a timely fashion. So we have to revamp it. I hope in the next council, we will. We haven't done it in this council. We haven't done it in any council. But And the fact that we shave off time on projects, yes, um, but not enough time where a, a park is sitting there. And I could take you to my running track. I could take you to my sprinkler system that took a, a year to do, and then it still didn't work. Uh, and it's still down. I could tell. I could take you to so many pro parks projects that went south very quickly. So there's a pattern here. We need to correct it, but we need a comprehensive plan, not just yes, we're working on it. So yeah. I'll leave it at that. I, I, okay. Hopefully, hopefully this time Commissioner Kavanaugh will reach out, or somebody will reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Our next uh, Council Member with questions is Council Member Brooks Powers. Time starts now. Hi, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Chair Ku and the Parks Committee staff for um, pulling together today's hearing. And also thanks to the Parks Department for providing testimony. Um, as you may know, I cover the Southeast Queens and Rockaway communities. We uh, have a very unique district, one that is um, um, inland part of the district and another part that's a coastal community. Um, unfortunately, many of our outdoor spaces are sites of chronic illegal dumping and our parks are no exception. Um, my constituents are often reporting issues like unmown grass, um, delayed repairs for soccer and football fields, um, that the city is slow to respond to issues, just broadly speaking. And over the summer specifically, I heard reports that the Parks Department only had um, three trucks addressing park conditions and none were fully functional in a part of my district. In that light, I just wanted to um, be able to understand a couple of things. So parks cleaning schedule, parks cleanings are scheduled based on location and usage of each park. How does the department measure usage? Is it based on the number of visitors? Does the department consider other factors like park size or volume of complaints or history of past inspections? How does the department allocate resources to ensure that park conditions across the city are addressed equitably? Um, what is the average response time for cleaning issues, so in terms of like litter, graffiti, dumping, um, what's the average response time for a structural issue, um, such as damage, play equipment, pavement, benches, um, and how do those um, times vary between dis districts and what will determine the variation of that. I will say also that 
I have an amazing work relationship with um, the folks uh, with parks from the Queensborough Commissioner docket to Justin and Eric who um, cover my mainland versus my peninsula district. Um, I just really wanna be able to advocate to make sure that they are having all the resources that they need um, in order to be as responsive as possible to my constituents. Um, and I know this is like a common um, theme in other districts across the city. So understanding what metrics parks looks at and how they respond um, would be helpful, not only in my district, but I believe across the city. So um, I look forward to engaging with you and your responses. Thank you, council member. I appreciate that. Um, and appreciate the kind words about the Queens borough staff and commissioner docket and they do do an excellent job. So uh, appreciate that. And, and Liam as well. I've been and working Liam. with Liam <laughs> and Matt. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really great team. So we thank you. Um, and we are happy to work with you individually. Um, and we, we should after this to address specific concerns in, in specific parks. But so I look forward to that, but I will, turn it over to Commissioner Kavanaugh um, to really dig into those metrics for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, and good afternoon, Council Member. Uh, it is a very sort of complex uh, balance of, 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 uh, of inputs that we use to determine our maintenance uh, of any individual park or playground or site that we're responsible for. for. Uh, first off, to, go, to start with, you know, we do have an objective standard that we try to apply to all of the facilities that we operate. Uh, it is the standard that's applied during the park inspection program. Uh, we look at the same features consistently across the entire city. Uh, we have objective standards that we strive to achieve uh, in every one of those parks and playgrounds or other facilities uh, that we manage. Uh, we consider, um, a lot of different inputs to decide what the level of maintenance we think is appropriate uh, for any given site. It includes the park inspection program results. It includes feedback from elected officials, community boards and individuals, 311 complaints, uh, the information that our park supervisors uh, generate during their inspections uh, and you know our own assessment of how a park or facility I'm is expired. viewed by the public. Uh, all of those things are, are sort of uh, brought together and we assign what we think, what we call as a service level agreement for every park. We determine the number of visits that uh, we believe is necessary for that particular park, playground or other facility uh, to, that should receive on a weekly basis uh, to meet the standards that we've established again, citywide. Uh, we track fairly rigorously uh, our ability to meet the service levels that we assign that we uh, assign for any given park, uh, and that is sort of the basis uh, of our maintenance approach. We make adjustments, of course, based on conditions that we're seeing uh, on uh, on the results from the park inspection program. Again, from the feedback that we receive from a variety of sources, including the elected officials. Uh, and yes, you know, we have been experiencing an unusually high amount of illegal dumping this year. Uh, and that is something that, uh, uh, you know, impacts our, our, our maintenance uh, regime in, in many different ways. You know, we're geared to, to maintain clean, operate parks uh, as, they, as, as they're used uh, traditionally. And that does generate sometimes litter, uh, graffiti, things like that. Waste, uh, I mean, illegal dumping uh, can be uh, you know, large quantities that require equipment that are that our normal maintenance crews don't have access to, and that can certainly uh, if impact the amount of time it takes us to address a condition like that. And similarly, uh, responses to conditions that are either brought to our attention uh, again through elected officials, community boards, the public, or through the park inspection program uh, can vary greatly based on the the type of uh, of, of condition uh, that's being brought to our attention. Uh, things like cleanliness uh, can be resolved typically in, a, in less than a day in most cases. 
uh, things like graffiti can be resolved unless it's on a, a sensitive structure or, 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 or stonework, uh, we try to remove within 24 hours. Um, repairs that can be done on a local level can happen very quickly within a day or two. More sophisticated repairs that require uh, skilled trades or uh, materials and equipment that are not available uh, within our uh, district operations can take longer. And then weather does impact our ability to make some of the repairs and improvements that are necessary. Things like asphalt and concrete uh, can only be done uh, when the temperature is at a certain level uh, and other times of the year, it's not possible to, uh, you know, to do effective repairs uh, of, of, of materials like that. Uh, so there are many different factors that go into both our, our uh, plan for maintenance, our execution uh, of that. You cited uh, vehicles. Uh, yes, occasionally uh, our vehicles are out of service and uh, uh, we are, they're not available for use. But I, I do have to say uh, we have one of the best fleet repair uh, divisions in the city and consistently have uh, among the highest uh, in-service ratings for our vehicles. Uh, Sorry, so it's something we do focus on. We understand that the impact can be significant, uh, but we do focus on that as well, among all the other factors that go into uh, our maintenance and uh, plan and our execution of that plan. And we'll be happy to go over in more detail for you know, parks in your district at, or, you know, at your convenience. No, definitely. And I thank you for that. I will say, though, in terms of the vehicles, we spent, I want to say, almost the entire summer without a functioning vehicle, where I felt like it could have been um, handled in a way where we pull a vehicle from uh, somewhere else that may have multiple vehicles as opposed to having no working vehicles in a district. And so as a result, I did receive a significant amount of um, complaints from the community in terms of the upkeep of Brookville Park because of um, the down vehicles. And I think there was something, um, one, one of the vehicles was extremely old is my understanding. So I think it was an engine problem. And the other vehicle, I don't remember off the top of my head what was wrong with it, but they require, it required a longer period of time for them to get repaired. And so things like that, I'd like to see, I guess the agency be a bit more nimble with the resources to make sure that we don't have communities doing without those type of resources. And the last thing I'll just say, and thank you Chair Ku for the um, time, I would just like to associate myself with a part of what Council Member Holden mentioned in terms of the timeline of um, projects with the Parks Department and Commissioner Liam Kavanaugh, we've met, um, in my district and talked about projects that the parks um, has in um, the hopper for District 31. And just would like to see these projects um, take place a lot sooner. Um, we, we find that in other parts of even the peninsula, there are projects that are starting up afterwards and finishing before. Um, some of the projects in my district and you know we'd love to see you know the beach 59th playground happen sooner the the um, capital projects along the bay area happen sooner um, so however we can work together to expedite those timelines i'd greatly greatly appreciate that thank you Thank you. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll go back to Chair Ku, I think, who has a few extra questions before moving on to public testimony. Yeah, I have an additional question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, uh, can I ask you uh, something about the pit inspection program? Uh, does the pit inspection program include assessing landscape? Thing? Uh, for example, whether the lawn is small or flower beds are intact, and if the trees have enough uh, dirt or wood chips around them. So uh, does your program include uh, uh, those assessments? 
Thank you, council member. Yes, it does uh, include lawn features as one of the categories, but uh, I will let Director Butler expand on that. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair Ku, for that question. Uh, yeah, absolutely, landscape features are a part of the, uh, the, the PIP calculus uh, uh, in terms of what, uh, what we inspect at a site. Uh, for trees, we're looking at issues such as dangling or dead limbs, uh, branches at eye level. Uh, we also note non-hazardous situations. So the tree is leaning, there's a cavity, things like that. Uh, and we've had training from forestry to align with their way of looking at trees to make sure that the way we're capturing things is as useful as possible to them. Uh, we, we look at hoard areas. Uh, we also uh, recently met with our horticultural people to make sure that we're using the right terminology there. Uh, they refer to things as mixed borders and rain gardens and things like that. So they showed us how things were supposed to look, including, you know, some of the newer designs, you know, some sort of more meadow-like areas and green infrastructure. So having a good understanding of what is and isn't good maintenance and again, capturing things in a way that's most useful to them. And then lawns have always been a part of the PIP program. Uh, and we have a standard uh, six inches is uh, the, the maximum height for most uh, non-irrigated lawns. And we capture bareness as well. And all those things can result in, in a feature failure or even a site feature uh, if they're, if they're uh, very bad in an inspection. Thank you. You're welcome. So, so I have a, actually, I have a few more questions uh, before I turn it over to the public. Uh, thank you, Director. Uh, so, Commissioner, uh, Local Law 98 of 2015 required that parks report on maintenance uh, resources allocated to various uh, par properties. So the question is, will this year's report be issued on time? Uh, the due date is usually uh, December 1st. Thank you. Uh Matt. Yeah, hi, uh, this, is, this is Matt. My understanding is, is that our uh, Innovation and Performance Management team, which is normally the team that uh, compiles all of that data that is available from a variety of sources uh, within it, is, 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 has been working with the boroughs to kind of uh, quality control uh, and review that data. But, but my understanding is it, it should be uh, released and available on time as, as it has been for the last several years. Okay. So did the most recent report highlight any areas of the city uh, where park resources are, and, uh, and where park re resources and maintenance suffer the most? Did you highlight which areas that, that they need uh, uh, special attention? I, I would... I would I would venture to say that the you know that the report has been a useful exercise you know every year as and but but layered over you know all the other data that's available to the agency including PIP inspection reports um, I, I'm not aware that it really identified any you know core uh, neighborhoods in need that wouldn't have come to our attention through a variety of other uh, avenues PIP inspections 311 data our, our staff you know analysis on the ground uh, Commissioner I defer to Commissioner Cavanaugh and others if they feel differently. Council member, the only thing I would add is that uh, uh, calendar year 2020 and fiscal year 2021 uh, will always have an asterisk attached to them, uh, indicating that it was that it happened during the heart of the pandemic. And local law 98, the report that we're generating, and as Matt said, yes, uh, we're, we're, we're reviewing it now and we will issue it on time, uh, reflects that. Uh, we see lower uh, resources recorded uh, you know, for all of our parks around the city, uh, simply because we did not have the seasonal staff that we normally hire uh, at the start of fiscal year 21, and that carried uh, through most of the fiscal year. Uh, so it is a little bit of an anomaly. It does, it will, you know, represent, you know, the, the, the maintenance uh, inputs of, of the agency, but it is a little bit different. It has to be viewed in that light, I'm afraid. Uh, thank you. So uh, what are the most common challenges or biggest obstacles uh, to keeping our parks and playground maintained? 
Well, I, I, I could start by saying, and I'd ask then Commissioner Kavanaugh uh, for his thoughts, but of course, usage varies widely and our PIP inspections and our monthly inspections, even by park supervisors are just that snapshot in time. And so often we'll hear reports that, you know, could be things have changed since we were there even a, a day or two ago. So usage varies widely, how the parks are used varies widely. Um, and of course, we, we are just monitoring that snapshot in time, which is incredibly helpful over a long-term view and to address problems immediately, the PIP results are addressed immediately. Um, but it is an ever-changing um, a situation, uh, you know, could be day to day even, but uh, more operationally, I'll let uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh address that. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Council member, I, I would have to say that uh, the biggest challenge in terms of maintaining parks at, at a high level, at a standard that we all want to see in our parks, uh, is misuse by a, a very small percentage of people who use the parks. Overwhelmingly, uh, the public treats parks with respect. Uh, they, they, they use them responsibly. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, we appreciate that greatly. And many, many people, thousands of people throughout the city uh, come out on a regular basis to help us maintain the parks. And uh, that is absolutely crucial uh, to having the great park system that we all enjoy. Uh, however, there is a, a small minority that has a has an outsized impact on the conditions of parks, unfortunately. Uh, council member uh, 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 mentioned earlier the, the illegal dumping. That is, again, unfortunately, a, a real problem. Uh, but we do see people who don't pick up after their dogs, uh, graffiti that was created in parks. Uh, I can't tell you how many times uh, we see people leaving food waste out in the open when there is a, a container uh, within, you know, 10 or 15 feet. Uh, and that's extremely frustrating for our staff who, uh, who try their best to keep uh, parks uh, clean, safe, uh, presentable uh, for the public. Uh, so it, it's really that small minority of people who misuse parks that has an outsized impact on, on what we experience in terms of our maintenance uh, chores and, 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 and responsibilities, and sometimes what the public experiences. So, oh, com uh, Commissioner, oh, are all parks clean every day, or is it uh, once a week, or how is it determined? Well, every park, uh, I was just I'll, I was gonna say, Commissioner Gamma started to speak that every park does have either a mobile crew assigned to it or a fixed post crew that are responsible for um, that park or that area. Uh, and they are there um, on a regular schedule. But Commissioner Kavanaugh, you can um, please shed, shed more light. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Commissioner. And thank you, Council Member. As I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, we look at a lot of different inputs to decide the level of maintenance that any given park should receive uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, that includes the park inspection program, our understanding of the utilization, the, the, the rate of utilization, the type of utilization, inputs from, uh, from 311 elected officials, community boards, things like that. And we develop what we call a service level agreement for each park or facility that we maintain. And that is, uh, that, uh, is the number of visits we try to provide on a weekly basis so that, that that park meets our standards. There are three broad categories for those service level agreements, uh, A, B, and C. And A means that we try to visit the park five to seven times a week. A B is three to five times a week. And a C is one to three times a week. And C's generally are green streets uh, and uh, smaller properties that don't have features and facilities like playgrounds or comfort stations or other things that attract people to stay for a long period of time. So that is our approach. We have a service level agreement for all of the sites that we maintain and our staff uh, is deployed to deliver on that service level agreement on a weekly basis. So, so if a pig one or a park 
does not meet the P, uh, the uh, uh, PIP inspection uh, criteria. Uh, does DPR in, uh, reallocate or increase maintenance resources? Council member, we don't reallocate based on one PIP inspection. It is a, a random inspection that happens twice a year. However, we aggregate those results to look for patterns either within a type of park, a district, or a sector. Uh, and if we see you know, a pattern that is showing uh, that we're not meeting standards uh, in a district or a sector, then we might make adjustments in the service level agreement or, or uh, the approach to maintaining the site. As Commissioner Fialkoff mentioned earlier, uh, we have what we call either fixed posts or mobile crews. It's a primary method through which we deliver maintenance and services. Uh, fixed posts require that we have a, a working comfort station to support the staff, uh, but there are some times when we're able to fix posts more when we see uh, persistent uh, uh, problems with maintenance. Uh, and that might be one of the strategies that we take to address uh, issues that are that are unearthed through the PIP inspection process or through other means. Okay. So how much of the agency's maintenance and operations uh, is done by seasonal or temporary staff? Uh, well, the seasonal staff work, you know, just during a, a certain portion of the year. It's a, approximately uh, four to five months. Uh, it varies uh, given some of the programs that we uh, operate. You know, for example, our beaches open uh, on Memorial Day weekend. Uh, so we begin ramping up the staffing for that, uh, for those places in April in preparation for the season. Our pools, which also uh, are major part of our seasonal plan, they open at the end of June. Uh, so we begin ramping up them uh, in mid-May and they go through the week after Labor Day, both of those uh, programs. Uh, and then in terms of our parks and playground maintenance, we do add seasonal staff to expand our operating day so that we can keep our comfort stations open later and deal with the uh, increased usage that we see throughout the summer. So during that period of time, from roughly the middle of April through the end of September, I would estimate that about 50% of the maintenance that we deliver is done through our seasonal staff. So, so what happens uh, to these staff members when their time with the agency ends? Uh, well, many of them are, are seasonal staff who return to us year after year. Uh, they have other, in some cases, I'm not gonna say all cases, some cases they have other employment that they return to. Some of them are students. Uh, many of them are students, in fact, particularly uh, among our lifeguards and the, and the staff who works uh, at our facilities during the summer months and they return to school. Um, but there are a variety of things that they do throughout the rest of the year. So what is the, what is the training process uh, uh, like for new seasonal hires or for temporary workers? Uh, how often does the, uh, does, does the agency have to do this kind of training? You do this every year? So when they come back next year, you still, they, still, they still receive the training? Yes, we do try to train and, re and orient our staff uh, and on an annual basis. And it, we do it in a variety of ways. For example, the Park Opportunity Program operates year round. Uh, and we have new candidates who enroll in that program throughout the course of the year. So we're constantly training the new arrivals in the park uh, opportunity program uh, throughout the course of the year. Uh, and then um, for our seasonal maintenance staff, uh, again, they come on uh, at staggered times from April through, uh, through the start of the summer uh, for different specific uh, aspects of our operation. And yes, we do want to train them, even if they are experienced and have worked for us before, uh, just to be certain that they uh, that their 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 skills are refreshed. They understand our our standards and goals and the processes that we use 
uh, to, uh, you know, to maintain parks and playgrounds. In some cases, there's a requirement uh, that they receive very specific training. For example, at our pools, we hire staff to operate the filtration systems in those places. And every year they have to be recertified and trained uh, to make sure that they are current with the whatever standards may have changed over the course of the year. There are very strict safety requirements for working in those environments. And we wanna make sure that those are emphasized and uh, fully understood by our staff. So there's a, and you know, there is equipment, uh, you know, for example, tractors and things like that, where you don't use uh, when you're not working for the parks department, and it really is important uh, that we provide a refresher training uh, to make sure that they're operated safely and effectively. Thank you. So what happens if a park fails uh, the inspection program every time? Uh, what happened to them? Uh, whenever a park fails an inspection, we go through a process to review the results of the inspection and uh, and look at what did our maintenance program do uh, in terms of that particular failure uh, or, or or any other issues in that park. So we look and see whether uh, we met the service level agreement that we established for the park. If we did, we look to see whether the staff was fully aware of uh, whether or not uh, of the condition that caused uh, the park to fail and the measures that they can take to address it. And, you know, if there are instances where, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing repeated problems, we may adjust the service level agreement, that is to increase the frequency of visits uh, to address the condition that has occurred, or um, if it is something that is happening that uh, shouldn't happen, again, something like illegal dumping, we will try to work with our park enforcement patrol uh, to uh, uh, enforce the rules around that. Uh, sometimes we're able to work with the sanitation department around illegal dumping. We've, we've done some effective work with them around that. Uh, and then to, just to publicize the fact uh, that you know, these, are, these problems are occurring and letting the community be aware so they can assist us uh, in, in limiting uh, those occurrences. So there are a variety of things we do, but we do look very closely at, uh, at unacceptable conditions that are identified for the PIP program and do our best to align our maintenance uh, to address them as they occur. So uh, are there any parks that uh, uh, fail the, the inspection program every year, um, uh, two, three years in a row? Are there any such parks? Uh, yes, there are there are parks that have failed, uh, you know, uh, yeah, constantly. Federal inspections. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, I won't ask you for names of that, but we can talk on the offline for that. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator uh, to uh, see whether the public has questions um, to ask us. Thank you, Chair Cooper. No, no, no questions. Uh, to give testimony, public testimony. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Chair Cooper. We can move on to public testimony. And thank you to Commissioner Fialkov and the reps from the Parks Department for testifying. At this point, uh, we will move on to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify, as I mentioned earlier. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak, so please begin once a sergeant has started the timer and given you the cue to begin. Council members who have questions for a specific panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after a panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, again, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the sergeant will give you the cue to begin upon setting the timer. So please wait, so please wait for that announcement uh, until you begin your testimony. At this point, I'll call on reps from DC 37 to testify. Joe Palio, followed by Daniel Clay. Time starts now. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Koo. Um, turn on my video. Okay. 
Okay, thank you, uh, Chair Ku. Uh, thank you, City Council members, and uh, welcome, Commissioner, uh, to uh, to our to our committee uh, to our community. Uh, I like to point out uh, when it pertains to the gardeners, uh, them doing maintenance work. Okay, we have uh, city seasonal aides and we have city park workers that uh, do this function. And we think that they are better utilized doing gardening work as opposed to doing work that uh, my members and 1505 members do. Uh, they get paid significantly more money to do these jobs. And we feel that they should uh, do the job that in which they were in, intended on, on doing. Um, uh, we've been fortunate this year due to the stimulus money that's been given to us. Like you mentioned, uh, we've gotten 3,000 workers for 21. And I believe some of that money is still left over, a good significant money um, that, that leaves us with 2,000 for 21. And uh, this is something that we don't know what's going to happen moving forward. Uh, this was again stimulus money and uh, we need this money to continue to keep the parks in the uh, condition in which they, they are now. Um, we are, are asking that we hire more uh, parks workers, uh, uh, specifically CPWs and CSAs uh, to uh, fulfill the obligations uh, to keep our parks uh, clean. Also too, uh, a lot of this, uh, you know, when it comes to cleanliness of the parks, uh, that was briefly mentioned, it's also due to our parks enforcement. Um, you know, a lot of the prevention uh, by them being at these parks prevent people from uh, littering our parks, uh, writing graffiti and causing other havocs in, inside the park. Um, you know, it, it should be noted that these individuals are needed as well and that their numbers, you know, have, uh, have declined and we'd like to see them um, increase as well. Okay, I know I have very a few time, a few, a few, few, very little time left. Um, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Daniel Clay, who will be followed by Adam Ganser and Carlos Castelcroque. Time starts now. Um, hi there, everybody. Uh, Daniel Clay here, um, gardener for parks in uh, Prospect Park and um, uh, longtime gardener and uh, new president of the um, local, of local pit seven. And I um, just wanted to um, thank everybody. Uh, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'd say I'm the most thankful person here as, uh, as uh, one of the members of the Boots on the Ground um, out here taking care of these uh, out of control old shrubs and uh, growing number of invasive species and as well as the garbage. That's the thing. It's, it's not uncommon, uh, not uncommon enough for a gardener to spend his or her entire morning or even day cleaning and uh, emptying garbage cans. And um, <clears throat> uh, that's the thing, um, I think this can be addressed. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, they will be soon, um, especially with um, uh, what I've seen as a, as a growing interest in um, parks, growing appreciation for parks. Well, sometimes it's not so much appreciation with all the garbage that's left behind, but at least a, a growing number of visitation parks. Okay, so thanks for your time. Thanks to the city council, thanks to, to the administration, thanks to East 37 and the orchestra parks. Um, I'll uh, yield my time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Adam Ganser, followed by Carlos Castelcroque. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Adam Ganser, and I'm the Executive Director of New Yorkers for Parks. I would like to thank Chairman Ku and the committee for the opportunity to speak today on these important issues. I wanna make clear from the start, the biggest challenge to a successful Parks Department in New York City is funding. Uh, the Parks Department can't tell you that, but we can tell you that. New Yorkers for Parks has championed for more resources for parks for more than 100 years. COVID-19 in the last 18 months have placed parks and open spaces at the center of all of our lives and drawn the attention of policymakers, our city council, and the incoming mayor, Eric Adams. The message is clear. Now is the time to fundamentally reboot the city's commitment to proactively resource our parks and our open spaces. 
The Community Parks initiative, initiative has been a successful program targeting parks in New York City that have not received investment in 25 years. The fact that we have any parks in New York City that haven't received an investment in 25 years, let alone the fact that we have hundreds that fall into that category is reprehensible. The mayor's announcement to expand that program is another small step in the right direction. It is important to clarify that CPI is not successful without the community engagement and outreach that is supported by partnerships for parks and the dollars that support those programs. We want to note, however, that this is a tiny part of a much bigger shift required in the investment of our parks and open spaces. While the parks inspection program captures a snapshot of the conditions of our parks, it does not capture the estimated $6 billion in deferred maintenance to infrastructure in our parks. There are no resources or urgency to fund a capital needs assessment, let alone finance and complete that actual work. It is all too easy to throw the parks department under the bus, but that completely misses the point and is totally inappropriate. The point being that our parks department has been functioning on a shoestring budget for decades at just 5% of the city budget, setting our park system into further disrepair. New Yorkers for Parks would like to use this moment to highlight that the incoming mayor, all leading candidates for council speaker, as well as dozens of city council members have agreed it is time for a fundamental change to this conversation and to increase the parks budget to the needs that New Yorkers have to 1% of the city budget. This investment will be transformative for New York's recovery, for the health of our citizens, for its climate resilience, and to make an equitable and healthy city. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. I agree with you. Thank you. Next is Carlos, Carlos Castell Croak, who will be followed by uh, Ted Enoch. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Carlos Castell Croak, and I'm the associate for New York City programs at the New York League of Conservation Voters. Um, parks are one of the city's most valuable environmental assets, and we must be investing in them to, in order to fight climate change and protect public health. Parks provide numerous resiliency benefits, increasing cooling by reducing the urban heat island effect, and fighting flooding by capturing almost 2 billion gallons of stormwater runoff. Parks also clean our air, absorbing pollutants and greenhouse gases that cause climate change. And lastly, parks provide safe, open spaces for recreation, an aspect that was highlighted during the height of the pandemic. In order to ensure that parks can continue to provide these benefits, we must be investing heavily in parks operations and maintenance. Parks too often are cut when money is tight in the city, as we saw in FY21. The direct impacts of cuts like this are obvious. 2020 was one of the dirtiest years parks had on record. However, it is also critical that we are funding the Parks Department consistently. Constant changes in funding levels year in and year out make it very difficult to maintain workers and allocate resources. This is why we are excited that Mayor-elect Adams, along with many New York City Council members, have committed to allocating 1% of the city budget to parks, an initiative that the Playfair for Parks campaign has see sees as a top priority. We hope that the full council will also uphold this commitment next year as the budget is negotiated and will ensure that this funding is baseline so that parks get consistent funding every year. Lastly, I'd like to thank Chair Ku for his service uh, as Parks Committee Chair. Uh, he has been a formidable champion for Green Open Space, and we will miss his leadership in the council next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ted, uh, Ted Enoch, followed by Roxanne Delgado. Time starts now. Hello, I'm Ted Enoch, Director of Catalyst, an intensive outreach effort led by City Parks Foundation and Partnerships for Parks. I send regards and thanks from our Executive Director, Heather Luboff, who is unable to join today, but who wants to extend her sincere thanks on behalf of all of us at City Parks Foundation to Chairman Ku and the entire Parks Committee for your unwavering dedication to our city's parks and open spaces. Partnerships for Parks, a joint program of City Parks Foundation and New York City Parks, helps turn community members and occasional volunteers into neighborhood leaders, building long-term investment in public spaces through the formation of friends groups that care for and activate parks. Parks are critical community resources that have become even more important throughout the pandemic and in our fight to combat climate change. 
We're excited about the mayor's expansion of the Community Parks Initiative to upgrade 100 parks and neighborhoods with the greatest need. When CPI launched in 2014, Mayor de Blasio cited the City Parks Foundation Catalyst Program as the proven model through which New York City Parks would engage community stakeholders such as friends of groups and help them build their own capacity to use, program, and be advocates for their parks. New York City Parks received $1.1 million in operating support to hire additional Partnerships for Parks outreach coordinators. Since then, that outreach team has played a key role in engaging 71 community partners in 67 CPI renovations, often recruiting and building grassroots support where no park group existed before. The team continued to support nearly 500 volunteer community groups and across the five boroughs, which is the largest such network of grassroots groups dedicated to parks in the U.S. Adding 100 new park renovations is incredibly exciting, but to ensure that CPI parks are well used in the long term, it will be critical to provide new funds to expand and support the partnerships outreach team who are on the ground every day organizing community members around both renovations, planning, and long-term care and use. We know that renovations are far more successful when the community not only provides input at the start, but is also invested in the ultimate success and care for the park once it is reopened. In this work, we see community members as our partners and the essential stakeholders in our effort to realize the potential of our parks and to bring these spaces to life. Finally, as an organization whose fundamental mission is to address inequity in our parks, we strongly believe the city's investment of 0.5% of the budget, 0.5, is insufficient to adequately maintain and improve these spaces. We join the Playfair Coalition in asking the City Council to dedicate at least 1% of the city's budget to parks to advance a visionary and pragmatic approach to meeting their needs. Thank you, Chairman Ku, the Parks Committee members, and City Council for organizing today's hearing and for your commitment to improving our city's parks and open spaces. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker, who is our last registered panelist, is Roxanne Delgado. Time starts now. Okay, thank you, Commission, for this uh, very informative hearing. I learned a lot about the Park Inspection Program. I, might, I would like to suggest a safety criteria in that inspection regarding, since we have an uptick in crimes in our parks, as well as incidents regarding e-scooters and uh, mopeds. So it'd be great if they consider a safety criteria in their inspection program within inside parks. Um, partnership for Parks is a great program, but it really doesn't work in the Bronx because when the partnership is one-sided, where we have volunteers devoting their time and dedication and resources to maintain their parks, but the park agency itself doesn't respond and do its part by addressing overfilled trash cans and addressing illegal dumping, illegal barbecuing, uh, a lack of tree care. So it kind of discourages uh, or, or impairs that partnership for parks relationship. And I'm very saddened because when people get involved in caring for the parks, they do it from uh, their good, uh, their genuine care for their green spaces. They're not doing it for anything else. They're not being paid for, to do this. Yeah, when our, we see our park agency not having that same devotion and care for our parks, it kind of discourages people from becoming leaders or stewardship of green spaces. And I just like to say that mismanagement and lack of accountability is the main problem in the parks in our Bronx. And this has to be addressed because I have people who refuse to go to your hearing to advocate for more funding for parks. And yes, they are extremely underfunded. There's no doubt about it. But they say, why should we do this? Because they just mismanage everything and they don't address concerns and they ignore the community. And there's a lot of like um, uh, bitterness towards the park agency, especially from volunteers who devoted their time and, and, and devotion for our park spaces. So this has to be addressed in order to move forward. And I think the mission statement of parks should be changed. It should be include environmental uh, justice and climate change because right now parks is not about protecting the trees or protect the green spaces. It's just like, oh, we're paid to maintain it and we'll do what, the minimum as possible. But we have to protect our green space. We have to protect our assets. Some of these assets will never be replaced and they're valuable resources for the community. So I'd like to thank the chair for his time. I'd like to thank the chair for all his devotion to these issues and holding this hearing. And have a happy holiday to you and your friends and your staff and your loved ones. Thank you. Thank you, Roseanne. Yeah. 
thank you very much. Uh, as I mentioned before, Roxanne Delgado was our last registered speaker. Um, if we had in, in, if we have inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify and has not been called yet, please use the Zoom raise hand function now, and you'll be called on in the order that your hand has been raised. Seeing none, I will turn it back to Chair Ku to offer any closing remarks and adjourn the hearing. Thank you, John. So I want to thank uh, the past Commissioner uh, Filekoff and uh, First Deputy Commissioner uh, Kavanaugh and Assistant Commissioner uh, uh, David Sharon, Director of Parks Inspection Program, uh, Mr. Butler and Mr. Jewelry, Director of Government Relations. And also our past committee, uh, Chris uh, Satori, our moderator and our uh, lawyer, and Patrick, Chima, and Monica. And also my uh, chief of staff, Elaine Chong. Mm. And also I want to thank all the council members who came today and, and all the public uh, for their participation. Thank you all. Uh, so the, this meeting is being adjourned. Thank you.